Father, I want to thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, and thank you that we can be here together and just study your word and gather around your gospel. And thank you, Lord, that we can have this platform where I can just share my heart and where you can speak to us and, and just encourage us in a great way. Thank you, Lord, for uh, speaking powerfully through me today and that every person uh, will be deeply touched and enriched by this message and the sharing and then in the communication that there will just be upliftment. Thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Right. Uh, I want to, you know, like I said last week, and I also use the same message for Sunday, is that we're talking about uh, fruit bearing and how God has come to bring forth fruit in the earth and how Jesus, as the last Adam, has come to bring forth fruit. And we're just going to look at that and just redefine some terms like grace um, and righteousness and those kind of things from that perspective. So I'm going to read from um, Romans 5. Uh, let, me, let me start on Romans. Yeah, let, let me do Romans 4.21. Romans 4.21. I'm just going to have Elena bring that up for us. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, Abraham and what righteousness is and what justification is. Because what we have, when we look at righteousness and when we look at justification, we, we didn't even understand the difference between the two. And then we've, we've had it solely based on legal terms, wherein we um, looked at it from a legal standpoint. You, know, like you remember the teaching that I did on the slave and the son, and how, a, well, how would a slave define righteousness, and how would a slave master define righteousness, and how would a father define righteousness? Now, what I'm basically going to say is that the way a righteousness uh, or a righteous act in a father-son relationship wherein uh, you stand righteous is by simply relying upon the father when the father has promised you something. That would be righteousness or that would be uh, imputed to you for righteousness or that would be seen as righteous. Uh, it would be unrighteous not to believe your father. So if we take that analogy that I've had <clears throat> about the father and the slave, uh, if a father comes and he promises the slave uh, or his son, which is in slavery, freedom, uh, the righteous thing to do, if you want to talk about works, the righteous act or what would place you in a place of the, uh, or how to define righteousness in the presence of a promise is to believe. Th that is the only way uh, we, can, we can define righteousness. Now, let us just read from verse 21. It says, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to, to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that was raised, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Okay, so uh, when we look at that, we can clearly see that righteousness was imputed unto Abraham. Now, you know, we've, we got so mixed up with this righteousness imputed because what we have seen is that the whole world is unrighteous and now uh, God decides to see us righteous if we pay him with faith, uh, which is not the case. And, and this is not what the scripture is trying to explain. What Paul tries to do here is he tries to explain to people that uh, the Gentiles has also got access to the grace of God. That is what he is trying to say. And we're going to define what grace is uh, as well. So he comes and he says the righteous thing to do because Abraham came and um, in verse 22 it says there, um, and verse 21 says, and being fully persuaded that God that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham believed that God promised him that he would be the father of many nations. In other words, that his, his name will continue to live in the earth and not die. That is what he believed. And when he believed that God was able to perform what he has promised, 
then Abraham was in the place wherein God said, this is as you ought to be in my relationship with you. If you want to be as you ought to be, that's one of the meanings for righteousness, is to be as you ought to be. The way you ought to be in the presence of a promise is to simply believe. Th that is all. And God has come and made his work in Christ to actually persuade our hearts. That's why I think we studied it in one Bible study here uh, where the scripture says, this is the work of God that you believe on Jesus. So God made it his work to persuade our hearts that he can raise a man from the dead and give him eternal life. So uh, in order to be uh, as you ought to be in the presence of God, it, uh, it is very simple. It is to believe that he can raise a man from the dead, that he can actually raise you from the dead in the return of Christ. That is, that is righteous. That is what righteousness actually is all about. That is how righteousness works. So, um, you know, we've made just a legal stand. And I remember uh, still a time when I defined righteousness in the parameters of the law, where I would say Jesus came and obeyed for me and because he obeyed for me, therefore I became righteous. Uh, which, in law terms, we can define it that way. But I think a more accurate way of defining it is in line with what is written here in, in, in Romans, where Paul comes and he tries to s explain to the people that circumcision wasn't what, what made Abraham righteous, or what uh, um, circumcision wasn't what made him as he ought to be in front of God. Uh, Abraham was already, if we want to define righteousness in another way, <clears throat> Abraham was already righteous enough, even without belief, that God would come and make a promise to him. So Abraham qualified long before he believed. He qualified uh, for the promise because God made uh, a promise to unbelieving Abraham, meaning even before Abraham believed, he promised him. So. Uh, as pertaining to qualification, that means does Abraham qualify for such a promise? Man, yes. Abraham was not circumcised. He was believing in other gods and all those kind of things. And then Abra God came and promised him. And then he believed that God could do what he has promised. And then Abraham was as he ought to be in the relationship that God had with him. Now, we're going to go to Romans 5. Uh, verse 1. So it says here, I'm just going to uh, quickly read 4.24 and 5 before we go to chapter 5 there. It says, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So it says here that we will be, uh, it will be accounted to us for righteousness or we will be as we ought to be if we can simply believe this promise. Now, the reason why Paul had this argument or this reasoning was he was trying to tell the people, you are not as you ought to be by obedience to the law. Uh, no amount of obedience to the law or even circumcision or, or any of those things can put you as you ought to be in the presence of God. No good work can ever put you as you ought to be in the presence of God. The only thing, if you want to define what must I do in the presence of God, is very simple, is believe on him whom he has sent. And what that means is you are believing on the one that raised Christ from the dead, and you also believe in what the one that was raised from the dead accomplished for you. That is it. And that is actually the Alpha and the Omega of um, Christianity as pertaining to your part of it. Uh, our part is simply to say, Father, if you've promised this, you can bring it forth. And if we take that truth and we align it to fruit bearing, we can say the righteous, if, if you want to be righteous or as you ought to be, uh, as pertaining to fruit bearing, it's very simple. It is, God, you promised us 
fruit. You've promised us life and you, eternal life, and you've also promised us the effect of that eternal life in the here and now. You've promised me that. And I believe that you can bring it forth in my life through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. So um, to be righteous before God is not defined in loving your neighbor. It's not defined in any of those things, but it's simply believing that God, by Christ doing, can bring that forth in your life. That is it. That is how simple it is. Now, uh, when we read, I mean, we can have a whole study on righteousness one day because there's so many aspects of this and so many different approaches. But in the context of Romans 4 here, um, Abraham was, it was accounted to him for righteousness for he believed that God could perform what he has promised. That is it. Now, with us, we need to ask ourselves, what has God promised? What is the promise? What is the word that was from the beginning? What has he promised us? He has promised us eternal life. That is the promise from the beginning. The Bible talks about the hope of eternal life. I've preached on that many times. I've shared in the Bible study. It talks about the word that was from the beginning. What was the word that was from the beginning? It's the promise of eternal life. The word of life, which was promised us from the beginning, came and lived amongst us, and we could behold its glory. We could see it. We could touch it. We could feel it. Um, we could see what this eternal life was all about. We could see a man die and him being raised again. And now we believe the Father that raised him from the dead will, through the Spirit, bring forth the very same in our lives. So uh, we can be in a place where we feel, I don't know if if I am living righteous enough or if I am actually making use of the grace message enough. You know, we always, there's always some place for law. But I want to just assure you guys that um, when you're in a place where you said, say, Father, you've promised it, you're going to bring it forth and there's nothing I can do about it. I can only promise you and I'm not going to consider the deadness of my body. In other words, I'm not going to consider, you know, the, the fact that I may be not seeing fruit in my life in a certain area. I just believe you and, and that's it. Now, where the difficulty comes in is because of the underlying law message that we have heard, wherein we want to um, look for mistakes and faults in our lives if we don't see the fruit. Now, I love what happened to Abraham. God promised him and he didn't see any fruit. And in the midst of no fruit, he was still righteous or it was accounted to him for righteousness or he was as he ought to be in the presence of no fruit, simply relying upon the Father. And that blesses me, you know, because never again will no fruit have a voice in our lives. Okay, now uh, chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 1 again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith, into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, now, what he is saying in that passage, uh, you, you can switch it over there. What he is saying in that passage is that when we simply rely upon the Lord, that God will bring it forth, we are as we ought to be in our relationship with him. But when we believe in him, we also now have access into the grace wherein we stand. Now, if you go and study this whole thing out and you're going to actually look at what grace is, you will see that grace is the divine influence upon the heart. And let us just look at the definition of grace. I want to read it to you. The definition of grace. Um, you then you can bring it up for us there. Okay. It is, um, I'm going to read from the Thaya definition here. I see next, I don't know how you can see it. 
dankie. Nee, dit is nie hy nie. Dit is... Nee, is nie probleem nie. Oh. Vers 2, net al in die boekkant, is boekkant. Ja. Nee, jy moet op die nommerkie klik, my liefde. Oh, sorry. There it is. It says, that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness, grace of speech, goodwill, loving kindness, favor, of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them, and unfortunately I've got something in front of it there, um, I can't read it, but it actually turns them to Christ, keeps and strengthens and increases them in Christian faith, knowledge and affections, and kindness. So what he's saying here is that grace is actually a certain influence that God has over people. Grace is an influence that God um, brings forth over our lives. Right. Um, okay. Right. So, <laughs> so I don't know. The computer's not working right there. Something's wrong there. So well, anyway, sorry for that. What grace is all about, it is simply an influence upon the heart of people. And that influence is through what Christ has actually done for us. Now, grace is not um, the super, just, just a supernatural influence. Grace is what Christ has done. So when the, when the Bible talks about grace, it's talking about the death of Jesus. You study Romans 5 out, the whole of Romans 5, you will see that the grace of God actually talks about Christ. It talks about the death of Jesus. It talks about what he has accomplished in the earth. And then through this grace, there is a gift of righteousness that comes towards us. So um, God had to come and bring forth a truth in the earth that could influence the human's heart to the point that he can um, receive eternal life. Now, this in this thing that he brought forth is called grace. Um, the way God influences our hearts is this way. He took a human being, put all sin upon him, put all death upon him. Um, he died, and when he died and was raised again, a truth was seen that is powerful enough to actually influence our lives unto Christian virtues. That is what it's all about. It says here, um, the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps them, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affections, and kindles them to exercise of Christian virtues. So what he's saying is that the grace of God will actually, the grace of God is such an influence on our belief that it gives us access to all Christian virtues to actually manifest in our lives. That is what it is all about. It gives us access to Christian virtues. And as we're talking about fruit bearing, we are seeing that um, when Christ comes and he promises us eternal life, and we look at the promise, and that promise was manifested in the earth in physical form. A man came to the earth, he had all sin all death upon him. He then died and the promise was fulfilled. He was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead. And when he was raised from the dead, what takes place in seeing all of that truth is it influences our hearts in such a powerful way that we can say, but that is a truth about me. When that takes place, we've got access into what takes what took place in Christ. And now we start to see God bringing forth the fruit in our lives. So, when we look at righteousness, righteousness is not by our works. Righteousness is not by the law. Righteousness is not by Judaism. The only way righteousness can be defined as pertaining to us standing in a relationship with God is simply believe what God has promised. Look at all the facts, and inside all those facts, 
will be enough evidence to persuade any person's heart. That is what I see. And when we look at that, and we find that persuasion rise up in our heart, and we say, God, you said this, you can bring it forth. And the moment you sit back, you, and you don't try to do it, but you sit back relying upon him, you are as you ought to be. And by doing that, or, or by standing in a place where you simply write on the Father, that's in that simplicity, you've actually now got access into this grace, which has got the hope of eternal life. That is what it says there. It talks about uh, verse 2. It says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So it says here that uh, by faith, by simply relying that God can bring forth what he has promised, that is all. He raised the man from the dead, which is Jesus, and that is a sign, and that is not just a sign, it is the truth about me, and he will manifest that truth in my life. By simply believing that, you have got access into the, this divine influence and what it can bring forth in this life. And what it brings forth in our life is the Christian virtues. That is what will take place. And then it says, we also now rejoice in the hope of God glorifying our bodies with immortality. That is what it says. Now I want us now, with that in mind, to go to uh, Romans 5 verse 15. Romans 5 verse 15. We're going to read from verse 15 to 18. And in this passage, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what grace is and how it abounds to us and how God will bring forth eternal life in us. And how the grace of God is the influence through Christ and how the promise is eternal life and how he will bring that life forth in us. And we can simply rely upon him. You know, um, when we, like in the, this time, I want to say, you know, in this time with my son uh, going through what he was going through, looking back at it all, I don't want to say um, I'm happy that something like that happened at all. But what I want to say is, I'm happy to see the power of the gospel working in us, even in, the, in, in bad situations. That is, it, it works. There's, there's a power, there is a peace, there's something that comes forth, because in that time, I never said, I must now have peace in this. This is now the time to try and rely upon Jesus, you know, to, uh, a peace come forth, you know, that kind of, none of that. It was, Lord, you promised me peace. In difficult situations, you promised me peace that is above understanding or peace that is above understanding is part of the promise, which is eternal life. That is it. You know, so when God came through his grace, this grace gave a gift, brought a gift. In other words, he had to bring Jesus so that he could gift us with eternal life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life or the gift of God's righteousness towards us is eternal life. And this eternal life will set me free from sins in this life. So I can come and I can say, I can be a partaker of the peace of God in times like this. Um, I can be a partaker of the provision of God. I can be a partaker of the life that he has given me for free. Now let us just read Romans 5 from verse 15 to 18. <clears throat> but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, and has abounded unto many, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, or you can take that word condemnation and brackets put there, death. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now just look at me um, quickly. This, when it says that, it's, it's simply, when it says, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification, it talks about the cross. It talks about the cross of Jesus Christ, which will be of many offenses unto justification. Then verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, 
much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. Oh, glory to God. Now, let us just go back there to, I just want to just, just look at me. I want to just have this verse 16. Uh, there's a very important thing there because it says there, but uh, the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Okay. The free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So how could it be of many offenses unto the justification of life? One offense brought death to many, but the gospel would be many offenses unto the justification of one. How would that take place? It would take place in God taking many offenses, putting it on one man and raising him from the dead. And that would be our justification. Our justification or to be treated according to our righteousness can only be manifested in immortality, eternal life. That is what it says. So here he comes and he says, through the offense of one, many died, but through the grace of one, the gift, there is a gift that will come our way. What is this gift? This gift is that we, according to verse 17 there, shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And then verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all in the very same way, uh, of the righteousness of one, the free gift comes upon all men unto the justification of life. So you will be justified with life. Um, now let me take this together. Let me take all this together. God comes and he says, listen, I promise you eternal life. I promise you, you know, my grace is that I can come in the worst situation and I can take your sin upon me. And in the presence of all sin, I can bless you with eternal life. That is what he says. And, and, and that is what, and when we simply believe that, that is counted to you for righteousness. In other words, the Jew said that if you were circumcised and obeyed the law, then you were as you ought to be to qualify for the promise of eternal life. But here God comes and he says, listen, just believe me. Just believe me, that's all. That is enough. And then Romans 6 comes, and this is what I'm aiming at, comes and says, shall we continue to sin now that we are in a place where God becomes sin, where God take our death? Shall we continue in the sin that grace may abound? In other words, that God can continue to bear this upon him? He says, no. We shall not continue there because we have been received the promise of eternal life. This eternal life's promise has now set us free from sin that leads to death. That is what he's saying, which gives us the hope today that we can actually today see freedom from sins or the fruit of the flesh in the here and now by the doing of God. Now, that is the reasoning that Paul uses, and, and um, I'm just going to quickly read it to you. Uh, it says in Romans 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are de dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that as many of you that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You know, we were baptized into the grace of God. What is the grace of God? The grace of God is the righteous act of God in Christ to take our sin upon him that can influence our hearts to the place where we can believe that our sin has died. That is what grace is. It is the divine influence upon our hearts through what Christ has done. So we are beholding the very grace of God here. What is grace? Grace is the obedience, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That is the influence, that truth influences our belief. And here we can see it. It says, shall we even continue to sin? No. Why not? Because when Christ died, because we are now under grace, we are now under the doctrine that says, my sin has died. 
That is grace. So when we believe that, we've got access into what actually took place there. And in that access, we find that the death of Christ kills the power of sin in our lives and not our doing. And that is what Paul tries to explain here. He's trying to explain that God will, he is the end of your death. He is the end of your sin. And the only thing you have to do is when he comes and promises you this and says, you are my own people. I promise you this. I love you. You qualify for this. All you do is you say, Father, I believe you. I believe you. And as you believe, it, it, as you look at what, what God has promised, and I want to say it this way. I thank God that he didn't just come and he promised us by as what he promised Abraham. You know, Abraham's promise was, listen, man, I promise you this. You know, and Abraham went and, and he did some radical things based on this word and he found a little bit of fear in his heart. And then in Genesis 15, God comes again and, and says to him, Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. And he talks to him about, he says, look at the stars. And when you see the stars and you see all of them and as, as you cannot number them, that is, and look at the sand, that is how your seed will be. So there was something, you know, God came and just maybe gave him a word, a promise, like I would promise my son or my wife something. But with us, the promise is even more vivid. He came and he didn't promise in the sense of an appearing, like with Abraham, and say, I promise you something. Although we would think today something like that would be very powerful. He came in a more powerful way. He took your life. He took your sin. He destroyed it. He raised you up, put a man at the right hand of the Father. And when we look at all of that and its conclusion, it is a promise to us. That's how he promised us. As we believe this, this promise, and we say, well, if my sin has died, then it means I'm, my, my, the power of sin has died, and my, the, the life in the flesh has died. He killed it. He ended it. And he raised, that, he raised the man up without sin, without death. Well, that must be the, that is my hope. So I just believe it, and I know where I'm going. That is all. That is the Alpha and the Meg Omega of our involvement from our side. The rest is God bringing forth his fruit in us and manifesting his life inside us. That is what it's all about. And when we read Romans, when we read the Bible, let us go and look at these things from the perspective of God bringing forth fruit in our lives and not us trying to work up enough faith for fruit. We don't have faith for fruit. We've got faith in God. And as we abide in him, he abides in us. In other words, as we continue to trust in him, and this trust is not a thing of God saying, oh, if you trust enough in me, then I'll do something for you. The trust is that he has done something. That is it. And what we see in Christ, that is what it's all about. So when we have that, we, we've got this, this, this trust in our hearts that brings forth, um, how can I say it? it? It brings forth a peace and a rest and then the obligation that has been put upon Jesus by lack of better words or the responsibility God freely took upon him to bring forth fruit in us starts to come forth. And we rest in that. And that is how the gospel works. And we even see that in Romans. The Bible says, um, since we have not seen our immortal bodies, what do we do? The Bible says we patiently wait. It sounds almost like laziness. But I want to tell you, by resting in God, we are more effective than the one that works hard. Uh, you, you know, if, if I would have come by works, and I would have built a big ministry by works. And I, a lot of you that are in this Bible study, you've got a passion for ministry and those kind of things. If your passion is for bringing forth something in the earth, ministry and that, you can work very hard. But at the end of the day, if it hasn't come by perfect resting and God bring it forth, guess what? Everything will be broken down 
again. And you're going to start over again. Because there is only one way. And that is God bringing it forth for free by his doing, by you resting. That is the most effective and the quickest way. You know, if, the, um, if there was any shorter, you, you know, there is no short way. The shortest way is Christ. That's the only way. And him bringing it forth and we simply relying upon him. I'm sure Abraham would have felt God could have done something quicker. You know, uh, and the way God does things doesn't always seem as if it is in our time frame. But what I can tell you is the quickest, most effective way unto a successful life. And I want to define successful life as a life of peace that comes by God's doing that cannot be defined by the things of this world. The quickest way unto that life is by saying, hands off, I'm, re I'm relying upon the Father. I'm seeing myself in Christ. I see myself in his grace, which is his influence by what he's done. And in his resurrection, I see a promise. And thank God that in this grace, he conquered sin, sin and death. And since I'm now in grace, which says, he ended my sin, and not under the law, which says, I must end my sin and obey, you know, sin has lost its power. Because we see how it's lost its power over Christ when he died and was raised. Glory to God. Now, well, that's what I've got in my heart for you guys. Um, and I just feel that the, the main message I want to bring across is we in the grace message can have an expectation of the fruit of God in our lives inside the parameters of trusting as what Abraham trusted. Uh, we look at Hebrews 11. People were not seeing the fruit of immortality in their lives and they were getting despondent. And what the writer of the book of Hebrews came and did was, he says, listen, look at all the old heroes of faith. Some of them even died without receiving the promise, you know, but they still had faith until the end. And they, they will be um, what, they, what, they, they, what they were persuaded of. Not even death could separate them from what they believed. And... I love that passage in Hebrews where it says that some of them even died without receiving the promise. What that means is that it, it so completely nullifies the voice of uh, the things of this world and manifestations. It makes the resurrected Christ and the hope of immortality the answer to all things. And we know uh, that it will take place by the doing of God. Who can make himself immortal? Nobody. If you cannot make yourself immortal, I want to tell you, you cannot even bring patience forth in your life. No amount of smiling in difficult situations can ever give birth to patience in your heart. No amount of giving can ever give birth to generosity in your heart. No amount of sacrifice can ever give birth to a sincere love in your heart. Only God can do that, and he has promised us his life. Glory to God. Well, I want to share that with you guys. Let us just open it up uh, for everybody.